so that here we, uh, this evening we have this book um, <laughs> just come out and and it's quite heavy and quite expensive um, and is by Dr. Thomas Macaulay uh, of Sheffield University and um, it is of course about tanker uh, literally short songs I suppose or short poems um, Japanese classical poetry and actually it's a, I think it's the first time we've had an event about tanker uh, here at the Daiwa Foundation over the eight years or so that I've been here um, so I'm very happy to get uh, Tom down to do this talk. Um, so he's a lecturer in Japanese studies at the University of Sheffield um, and he uh, he's going to show you the the web link I think later on but he runs a website which is called wakapoetry.net um, which uh, is devoted to trying to uh, make available in English uh, the enormous classical collection of Tanka and I, I believe that Tom himself has translated over 5,000 of these poems, they are quite short, of course, but uh, even so, that's an, Im <laughs> that's an impressive achievement. Uh, over 5,000 of them on that site. And he's also been doing a very interesting project looking at botanical gardens in Japan. Um, and I didn't know this until I had a grant application uh, <laughs> about it, but uh, there are over 30 uh, manyo en, uh, or sort of botanical gardens, which uh, contain the plants mentioned in the Manyoshu, Japan's earliest major collection of poetry um, and he's trying to uh, make those more uh, put, uh, we'll put them on the map for foreign tourists as well but anyway I think that's probably enough intro so okay. over to you well thank you very much <laughs> okay thank you Jason for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to mm -hmm. come and talk about this translation of the poetry competition in 600 rounds, um, a task which has taken me uh, a good part of the last 10 years to actually complete. Um, my head of department at Sheffield is fond of saying that I'm the only person in the department who's um, produced a book which is um, heavy enough to kill someone if you drop it out of the window by mistake. <laughs> um, and I think seeing it sitting here on the table, you can see why. Okay, so I'm going to start um, at the very end of the competition with these two poems. Um, one by the judge, Fujiwara no Shunze, and one by the sponsor of the competition, Fujiwara no Yoshitsune, although he hides his, his um, identity behind the um, nom de plume of a servant girl on Yobo um, there. So at the very end of the competition, Shunze produces this particular poem here. Sumiyoshi no matsu wa ware mo kakeyasemu yasoji suki yuru wakano uranami. At Sumiyoshi will the pines feel compassion for me, spending more than 80 years washed by the waves of Wakabe. Now this poem is replete with um, a variety of allusions to which any um, appropriately knowledgeable person would understand. Um, Sumiyoshi is the location of Sumiyoshi Grand Shrine, the deity of which is the patron of Waka. Um, Waka Bay, um, Japanese poetry, is a natural location and so is used for that echo. Um, pines, of course, are also very long lived plants. So Shunze is saying with his poem there, will the knowledge of, that I have produced, my knowledge of Waka, still have red redolence? Will it be known and understood? after I'm gone. How have I produced something for posterity in this competition, essentially? Yoshitsune replies, Wakanoura no shirube to nareru, oi no nami ngeni sumi yoshi no matsu mo shiruram. To Wakabe a guide have you become, washed by the waves of age. Truly a sumi yoshi, the pines will know that well. So he, of course, politely replies, yes, indeed, your poetic knowledge will last, will live on after you have died. And the fact that we are now standing here some 850 years after this poetry competition was completed suggests that he was right, and that Shunze's worries that all of his knowledge would disappear after he was gone was uh, ill-founded. So, what I'm going to do today, um, quite briefly, is talk about the context of the poetry competition in 600 rounds with a brief introduction to uh, poetry competitions Utawase themselves. Um, I'll talk again briefly about the critical criteria, what, we, what was important in terms of producing a poem for um, poetry competition, before talking about the poetry competition itself. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about who actually took place in it, who the poets were. I'll talk about um, the judge, Pujiwara no Shunze, and the appeal against his judgments as well. Um, it was common if you disagreed with the judge's judgments about your poems that you would write an appeal complaining and explaining why the judge was wrong. Um, and the, the single most major appeal um, is here in the poetry competition in 600 rounds. Um, I'll give some examples of the types of critical conflict and discussion which took place in the competition and then talk about poetry comp um, the poetic quality as well. And finally, um, to cap things off, I'll talk a little bit about how I produced this translation and why it looks the way that it does in terms of the various decisions that I've taken in order to produce the actual work in the format that it is now. So, to start off with, the context of the poetry contest in 600 rounds. Um, I'm going to skip the historical and social context and focus on um, poetry contests specifically themselves and talk about them. So, poetry competitions had a long tradition in uh, Japan. The, the very earliest one took place in, a, in the 880s. Um, at that point, they were, and they continued to be, intrinsically constrained socially um, um, occasions, by which um, I mean that it was only possible to compete with people of a similar social status. Certain people, if you were too low ranking, you couldn't actually meet the, be allowed into the emperor's presence or the presence of high ranking nobles. So you had to have competitions amongst people of similar statuses to yourselves. Um, that didn't mean that lower ranking poets couldn't have their poetry appreciated at higher ranking poetry competitions. Um, it was possible to write a poem and then have someone of more senior status actually present it and read it for you, um, or present it as their own work, essentially. Um, but if you actually wanted to take part in a poetry competition, generally you were taking part with your social equals. Okay. Um, however, as time moved on um, from the 880s through to the 1190s, which is when the Rock Pantawase, <coughs> the poetry competition in 600 rounds, took place. Um, poetry competitions changed. So they started off as social entertainments. So in the very early poetry competitions, most of the comments you get are about the gorgeous clothes which people were wearing, or how lovely the various um, stimuli for poetry competition, act competition actually were. Um, as we move through history, they become more political statements in that it was, of course, extremely expensive in order to, to actually put on a poetry competition in formal ways. You had to pay for um, the venue, you had to pay for chairs, you had to pay for refreshments, you had to pay for prayers, you had to pay for people to cheer the winners and um, be thankful, grateful to the um, express commiseration for the losers. You had to arrange vestments and all kinds of different kinds of things had to be paid for by the sponsors of these competitions at the most formal level. So um, if you were able to put on a major poetry competition, it was an indication of your wealth and power. So if you were an ambitious noble um, or a noble in a socially significant position at court, then putting on a poetry competition was a way of stating how important you actually were. And indeed, not just the nobility, but of course the imperial family would sponsor these occasions as well as a way of stating their own power and status. Um, as poetry became increasingly um, tied up with the nature of literature and aesthetics, however, um, they also began to become increasingly literary critical occasions where different views of what poetry was were expressed, arguments and critical compositions actually took place. Um, that happens around about 1060 or so. Um, so it's after 1068 um, that judgments become really significant, that you get people judging the quality of the poems and um, commenting on how they were cr critically constructed. Okay. But what were these poems? What were the appropriate poems to be used in a, an utawase, in a poetry competition? Okay, well there are a number of key criteria for them. Perhaps the single most important was composition on a topic, a dai. Okay. So the sponsors of the competitions would set out a range of topics and poets had to produce poems on these specific topics. Okay, and they had to adhere to the conventional conception, kokoro, the idea of what that topic actually was. So as more and more poetry was um, composed, as poetry developed, particular topics came to have particular associations which were conventionally um, what they actually meant. 
So if your poem um, didn't reflect that conventional perception, it wasn't a good poem. Key other feature was recitation aloud. Okay? The poems would generally be heard before they would be read. So it was a key criteria that poems should actually be able to be easily understood if they were actually, when they were actually formally recited out loud. Um, in the poetry competition in 600 rounds, <coughs> Shunze um, uses the term kikoyu kokoyu, it sounds like, or it sounds good, it sounds poor, almost twice as much as he does miyu, it appears or seems when actually reading. So the fact that poems should be able to be heard and understood was a key criteria. And if they couldn't be easily understood when they were recited, then um, they would generally not be considered particularly good. Okay, um, another feature was that they had to be formal. Hare is the Japanese term for that. Now, hare had two different features to it be for a poetry poem to be appropriately formal. First of all, um, it had to demonstrate the avoidance of excessive personalism and excessive emotional displays of any kind. So um, you couldn't express strong, violent emotions. Um, that could be fierce and frightening. People wouldn't like it. It would be dangerous. Um, but also, it had to be realism. It had to be realistic. So poems had to describe the world as it was and the normal behaviours of animals, plants and birds and so forth, um, as poetically accepted, I should say. Um, and if your poem described the behaviour of an animal or a situation or a location which wasn't um, part of the um, conventional expectations of how that uh, animal should behave or that lo how that location was believed to be, then again, it wasn't a good poem. Um, it had to use appropriate diction, right, which it means you had to use appropriate poetic language that was novel or elegant. Um, there were, however, disagreements between different poetic houses or different poets as to where novelty or elegance could be found. Modern poets of the time would tend to think we could, um, they could introduce language from everyday life and that would be a source of novelty. Conservative poets regarded that as an injection of uncouth behaviour and uncouth language into the beautiful tradition of Waka and said, no, if we want to search for novelty, we have to go further back into history, go back to Manyoshu, um, the language of the 8th century, um, and find language which is used in that and bring that into the modern time. Finally, um, configuration was also an important criteria, sugata. So what was the overall effect of the poem's combined conception and diction? Did it produce a beautiful overall effect, um, put, putting everything together? And we'll see some examples of what that looks like in some of the poems which I'm going to talk about now. So let's get on with the actual competition itself, the poetry competition in 600 rounds. Okay, um, what can I say about it? It took place between 1192 and 1193. Um, it was sponsored by Fujiwara no Yoshitsune, um, who was the son of the regent. Um, he was in his 20s at this time, and one of the young men whose stars was actually highest at court. And his sponsorship <coughs> of the competition at this particular point in time was a, a key indication that he felt ready to present new forms of poetry for a formal public scrutiny, um, to work with other famous poets, um, and again make a political statement about the importance of his house at that particular point in time. And it's likely that his sponsorship of the poetry competition in 600 rounds um, formed a major stimulus to Emperor Gotoba a few years later, deciding to reactivate the poetry office at court to sponsor a brand new imperial anthology of poetry and eventually uh, put on the poetry competition in 1500 rounds in 1204. Um, the competition was judged by Fujiwara no Shunze, who I will talk a little bit about later. Um, it had 12 participants, 600 rounds, 1,200 poems. It's what's known as a hyakushu utawase, in that what Yoshitsune, as the sponsor, did was present a list of 100 topics to his chosen participating poets and say, I want you to compose 100 poems on these 100 topics. Um, when he received these 100 poems, he then put them together against each other into rounds for the actual competition. So it is an artificially created or deliberately created um, competition where he was playing off poems by um, 
poets of varying temperaments and styles as a way of stimulating critical discussion and debate. Um, Kenshaw, um, in fact, bitterly complains that he wasn't told before and that this was the intended act, um, outcome of his Andrew poem sequence. So he says, I wasn't told about this. So I, so I would have done some of my poems completely differently had I known that it was going to be turned into a poetry competition. Um, so, you know, there, there are some ideas about that. Um, of the actual poems themselves, 50 were on seasonal topics and 50 poems on love topics. <coughs> so, dividing between the two major fields of Waka poetry. Some of the <coughs> topics were extremely well, well trodden and had been used many, many times before in other compositions and competitions. Um, some of the topics were presented by Yoshitsune for the very first time and so were entirely novel. These obviously pre presented more challenge to the poets composing on them because they had nothing to build on. They had to, nothing, no prior examples to actually work with. Um, and some, that obviously again poses difficulties for Shunzi in judging them because he had no prior reference sources to actually look at. Who actually took part? Well, let's see. Here is the list of participants, um, divided into the teams of the left and the right. Um, of the various names and names of the people you can see here, um, presented in rank order, perhaps the only one who is particularly well known these days would be Fujiwara no Sadaie, or as he's better known, Fujiwara no Teika. Um, he um, is best known these days, I think, in Japan for putting together a collection called the Hyakunin Ishu, um, 100 poems by 100 poets, which is used as the basis for the New Year card game, which is very commonly played by Japanese people. Um, a number of these poets, again, appear in that actual <coughs> collection, but uh, most of them are known now only to um, scholars. Um, they represent two, essentially three different groupings of poets. Um, there are a group of conservative poets who represent the Rokujo, the conservative poet house, poetic house, uh, a group of modernizing poets um, who represent the Miko Hidari, um, the modernizing poetic house, and three um, young men, so um, Yoshitsune, Iefusa, and Jien there, um, who were from the upper echelons of the nobility and so weren't associated with particular poetic houses themselves. Um, the ages of the competitors ranged from <coughs> early 20s to mid 60s, so there's a wide range of different ages um, and levels of poetic knowledge and experience um, represented here. In terms of the actual judge himself, Fujiwara no Shunze, um, as Robert Huey has said, he was probably the most accomplished critic in Japanese literary history. Um, he was probably, again, the last um, major critic who was respected by the entirety of the court nobility. After um, this period, about, but within about 20 to 30 years of this, then increasing factionalism in the world of poetry meant that it became increasingly difficult to get uh, poets from different houses and traditions in the same room together because they would simply argue and disagree about everything and say that um, the poetic approaches of the others were just wrong. So um, Shunze was the probably the last one who could bring everyone together and whose opinions would be respected by all. Um, he was, of course, a very accomplished poet, but he was equally a very accomplished uh, poetry competition judge. As you can see there, his first extant poetry competition judgment um, dates from 1164, and the entire first entire contest which he judged dates from 1166. So by the time of Rok Yakuban Utawase, he had been judging poetry competitions for about 30 years. Um, so he was extremely experienced and well able to do this. Um, and he carried on right up until his death in around 1204 with his final judgments from 1202. Um, there's some disagreements against, amongst scholars about the total number of judgments which he actually um, we have left. Um, Minagishi there says there's 1,937, and Clifford Royston says 1,793. But 
whichever figure is correct, that means that the Rock Jacobin Utawase represents about a third of his total poetry, poetry competition judgments. It, so it's also, therefore, a major statement of his views on poetics, aesthetics, um, at this point in his late point in his life. Um, there is also the appeal against his judgments, um, written by the monk Kenshaw. Um, now, Kenshaw is a somewhat murky figure in that he was, we don't actually know where he came from, but he was ad um, adopted by Fujiwara Akisuke, um, who was the founder of the Rokujo Poetic House, but took orders early as he was not going to be in the official line of succession or anything, um, and became resident at the Ninaji, Nina Temple, um, where he was fortunate enough to be uh, patronized by a member of the imperial family, close to Prince Sukaku. Um, and this um, imperial patronage enabled him to become a major scholarly expert in a range of um, areas. He was particularly known for the Manyoshu, mm. but he also um, was an anthologizer. He produced commentaries on Kokinshu, Gosenshu, and a range of other anthologies and early poetries as well. Um, he is, by definition, an erudite and intellectual poet, and he wrote um, the Chinjo against uh, but Shunze's judgments. Um, the, of all of the various chinjo which are available, Kenshaw's chinjo is the one which most closely resembles a work of poetics in its own right. So he's arguing in the chinjo against Shunze's judgments, but for his own views of how poetry should be judged and what poetry should be. Um, and we'll see some examples of what he has to say about that um, in a few minutes. He also uses a lively and outspoken style in his writing, as uh, Okada has said. Uh, which often makes me think when reading through his work, he uses things like this. Um, Shunze's judgment here is like sitting in front of a stump attempting to catch a rabbit. He says something like that. Or, um, you know, this argument is like grabbing a serpent by its tail. Okay, so oh, I often wonder whether the reason why he was invited to participate in these kinds of activities is that he would always be guaranteed to be good fun. Um, certainly one of the most famous anecdotes about the competition, even though it was written um, almost a hundred years after the competition took place, says that um, when the actual formal part of the recitation of the competition was taking place, um, some of the participants didn't go every day, but Kenshaw and Jacqueline went every single day and argued vis um, vigorously with the priest, Kenshaw, shaking his um, scholarly mace and uh, Jacqueline sitting with his head thrust forward like a snake. So the court, the ladies of the household called them the Honourable Mace and the Honourable Snake. Okay, so um, one can imagine that there was plenty of fun to be had going on in there. <coughs> but what can we say um, about the critical conflict and take some examples? Let's move on to actually look at some of these poems. So here's an example of um, a poem on Skylarks by Kenshaw, um, which is Haruhi ni wa soro ni no mikosu wa garumere, hibari no toko wa areyashi nura. The springtime sun, alone into the skies, does seem to lift the skylark, his nest. I wonder if it is in disarray. Um, now that might seem like a perfectly nice little poem about skylarks, but what does Shunze have to say about it in his judgment? He says, the initial stanza of the left poem is truly awful. Okay? In general, from what we know of how skylarks live, there is no reason to expect that they would heedlessly fly off abandoning their nests. In spring, they raise their young in the fields, and when the evenings are warm or the spring sun is bright, they remain flying in the sky and look down on their chicks from above. They are birds which swoop and soar. Thus, one cannot say that they heedlessly abandon their nests. So, he's criticizing Kenshaw there for First of all, producing work which doesn't sound very well. He he's, doesn't like this line, Haruhi ni wa, which would be something pronounced something like Haruhi ni fa uh, in the uh, Heian Times. Um, so he doesn't like the sound of that when it's actually presented. But he says that this poem doesn't reflect the officially understood nature of what a skylark actually is and how it behaves, and therefore it's a poor piece of poetry. Um, Kenshaw, of course, doesn't agree <coughs> with this. Um, so in his appeal, what does he say? He says, composing the springtime sun is an ancient term. Given that such poems have been composed before, it seems that there is no reason to deliberately criticize the initial springtime sun, is there? So, as someone who um, was 
a manual expert, he was well aware that many poems from the manual should use this particular phrase. He says, if this phrase occurs in earlier poems such as in the manual should, why criticise it? Shunze is deliberately picking fault with my work. Okay. And he then continues, the judge has passed sentence on the facts and exerted great effort in finding fault, so I will correct him. It is normal practice in much Japanese poetry to prioritise the emotions and not to oblige matters to conform to reality. It seems in spring that Skylark simply saw, so composing that they would not abandon their nest would be just as much of a guess. If we truly examine the facts of the matter, him saying that Skylark saw in the skies looking down on their chicks in the fields could be to be questionable. It is impossible to know what a Skylark feels. If one is in a place where it could look down on its chicks in the undergrowth, it might be that it might not saw in the sky all that much. <laughs> okay, so um, he's disagreeing with Sun Tzu's view that his poem doesn't reflect the nations of Skylarks. And he presents, after this, 20 poems where... Um, matters do not conform exactly to reality, and some of which have even been included in imperial anthologies and therefore, by <coughs> definition, are good poems. Okay. So he's seemingly not paying attention to the actual criteria for Utawase poetry to be appropriately formal. Um, this may be a reflection of his view or his understanding that his poems were not necessarily to take part in the competition. Okay. Um, Let's take another look at something else, the use of evidence for making critical judgments. Um, we have two poems here, both of which use this particular term, kaya, which I've translated as heated hut. Um, one by Kenshaw and one by Jacqueline from later in the competition. Um, Kenshaw's poem is on frogs, the topic of frogs, and Jacqueline's poem is on the topic of love and smoke. So, Yamabuki no niyoi de oba yasu ni mite kaya gashita mo kawazu nakunari. Golden carrier, glowing ni day, all indifferent beneath the heated hut too, the frogs are calling. Yamaba mo ru kaya gashita no kemuri koso kogare mo yoranu tagu inakari nari kere. Warding mountain fields beneath the heated hut, the smoke smoulders without end, and so do I. Now, at this point in time of the composition of, of the competition, um, there was disagreement over exactly what a kaya was. Okay, there was vigorous disagreement about this. Um, and this was a cause for major critical debate, uh, which goes on in the competition, as we will see, um, with a lot of toing and froing between the various participants um, in the round on frogs, and Shunze eventually coming up. Um, this is an, an excerpt from his judgment, but uh, what he actually has to say about it is... Um, um, the conception of heated huts uh, is of fire being kindled there, making them smoky, or else to keep wild monkeys and deer away. And thus, while there are these two possible explanations of mosquitoes or deer, it is certain that smoke and fire are the remainder. Now, that's a bit obscure. What he's doing there is referring to the actual Chinese characters which were used in Manyoshu to write um, the word kaya, um, where ka can be mosquito or it can be deer. Um, different, the character is used there. He, the kahi was fire. Um, yeah, so forth. Um, so, moreover, there is an alternative explanation of by folk in recent years. Folk is a concealed reference to the Rockajaw family, um, so Kenshaw's family, um, of calling um, a hut built over fish traps long made by thrusting branches into river ponds a heated hut, a kaya. This too is a mistaken theory. Okay. And so we come to the previous discussion of the being for silkworm holding. Um, silkworm keeping in the country, and for frogs gathering underneath them to eat the silkworms. This does not hold water. What earthly reason is there to suppose that the peasants would allow frogs into such valuable places as their silkworm houses? Nor can one conceive of them permitting water to flow beneath them or construct them near marshes or ponds. As for the gentlemen at the left, the team of Kenshaw and Kenshaw himself, the only conclusion is that they should cease to circulate their theories. Okay. So, it's very critical and it is knocking down every single one of Kenshaw's potential explanations for what um, a kaya actually is. Um, one of my, the Japanese scholars who I, I read about this says that um, criticism of this time is like playing an endless game of whack-a-mole. So your uh, poems will put up a theory and you would hit it down and, as, as firmly as you possibly could. So, um, Kenshaw, of course, takes great exception to this. Uh, he says, 
there is evidence to support the view that both types of kaya could be mentioned. And there is no evidence which would enable one to consider that there was a single fixed definition of them. I will conclude by providing a small amount of prior evidence. Is the kaya a fish trap? A large number of peasants in the countryside have told me, Fushizuke is when you collect water plants from deep um, within river mounds and also gather fish and catch them. Um, what you do is put a roof above, and just like with huts out in the fields, the inside is kept dark by spreading straw or grass on top. And this also prevents birds from flying down from above. Since bait is scattered about and fish gather there, these huts are called kaya, or sometimes kakiya, or kawya, or sometimes kaya too. Exactly how these are set up varies from place to place, and so their names differ. However, the above is a general explanation about kaya. People who only see this fail to understand the true nature of a kaya, and it is only logical that they should be dubious about it not knowing the term kaya. I have urged peasants from many places about this many times, and I believe it to be true. So, Kenshaw, as a monk, is actually able to go out from the capital and meet people who actually create these things and talk to them. And so he's using their evidence and their terms <coughs> as evidence for the appropriateness of his poetic theories. In this, he is reflecting a tradition of poetic um, commentary and usage of um, testimony from local residents about the nature of diction, which developed from um, poets of the provincial governor class who were sent out from Heian-kyo to um, rugged provinces. Obviously, they need to entertain themselves, and one of the things they did was actually go out and talk to the local people. And when they discovered sometimes that they had different explanations for the meanings of words which are used in poetry, um, one of my scholars again described it as, as they fell into a state of, uh, of maniacal ecstasy, of joy, of uh, finding these different explanations and imported it into their commentaries and brought it back. Um, so Kenshaw is reflecting this tradition in what he's actually saying. But I think it's quite interesting in that he is um, talking to people of the highest uh, social status. He's saying that evidence which is, comes from the lower social classes, the peasantry, should actually be taken into account and used, uh, accounted as credible for poetic judgments. There's a number of times in the competition where he actually does this. Um, um, and it's one of his, the major differences between him and Shunze. Okay, um, one final example. One of the major features of uh, uh, poetry at this time was the use of intertextual referencing, referencing to other sources as a way of bringing in evidence uh, and making the importance of your poem. So here we have um, a poem by Kenshaw on the topic of love and paintings. Ito warete mune yasukarane omoe oba hito no ue ni zo kaki tsuchi tsuru. Being despised in my own quiet heart, filled with feelings, upon her I paint them out, he says. Now, that might say, that seems, where is the reference to something else in here? Um, well, the right um, team don't understand this either. They say, what's the left poem about? And Kenshaw replies in appeal, it reflects Chang Kang, <coughs> um, who was a, a Chinese po a painter from the uh, early 200s. Um, who, feeling the woman next door, was beautiful, painted her, and was then able to meet her. Um, now, Chang Kao actually uses a sort of voodoo magic to meet this woman, in that uh, he paints a picture of her and sticks a nail in, the, in her heart, in the image. She gets a very bad pain in her chest and falls ill. Um, and so he pops around the house and says, I can cure her. And so, oh, please do. So he goes back takes the nail out, dips it in honey and puts it back and she makes a miraculous recovery and he's then invited around to meet the object of his, uh, his desires, so it's a slightly magical tale. Um, now, this is a relatively obscure story about a relatively obscure Chinese painter um, and Shunze doesn't think much of it and he says, I too was unsure of the meaning of my unquiet heart filled with feelings upon her um, and after reading the left's response, I am still unclear. In general, in these cases, it is customary to cite the source of such things, and to hear of such wide reading is interesting indeed. But this is simply, it reflects Shang Kang, who, feeling a woman living next door was beautiful, painted to was then able to meet her, meet her. So it would be difficult to locate within the usual three histories, um, the three histories of China. Furthermore, I, ha I have no recollection of a person named in this Chinese manner, and so an ignorant old, my old man like myself can only ask, who is this Nagayasu? Nagayasu being the Japanese reading of the characters uh -huh. used here. Okay, so he's being jocular in his, uh, in his, his judgment there. Okay, Kenshaw, what does he say in his appeal? Um, 
on the matter of the fault that the story of Chang Kang and the woman is non-standard, it certainly is. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with using rare and erudite material. It shows that your poem is based on intelligent material and, and deep scholarship. Um, um, one should not compose on, uh, on, based upon sources of which people are not normally aware is the substance of the aforementioned gentleman's ideas. During the discussion, I explained the basis for the poem in detail and even made it excessively clear. So it was, of course, entirely logical that there should be a lack of definite understanding of the question of who Nagayasu was. There is something which has been said since times of old. Writers often write shallowly, widely, and mistakenly. The judge, too, is an unenlightened man. Uh, so there are things he does not know. Furthermore, while he finds fault based upon matters of which he is aware but is mistaken, there are many extremely famous examples of writers who have encountered sleeping dragons. Now, again, this is an obscure reference to a previous poetry competition, um, which was um, jointly judged by two very famous poets, Minamoto no Shunrai and, Minam and Fujiwara no Mototoshi, both of whom were actually both taking part in the competition as well. Now, in one of um, Shunrai's poems, he uses the word dragon, which is tatsu, mm. but was written identically to the word tazu, meaning crane. And Mototoshi, when reading the poem, misread tatsu for tazu, and spends an enormously long time in his judgment going, well, this use of crane is very strange, isn't it? I don't quite see the link with the rest of the poem. And, but if you do look at this bit of Chinese book on the history of cranes, well, it might make some sense and so forth, but I'm really not sure about it and so forth. And Shunrai, in the competition, doesn't correct him, doesn't say anything, until later, afterwards, the uh, judge asked for some further comments from the uh, um, poem from the uh, judges, and Shunzai simply writes, it's not a crane, it's a dragon. <laughs> uh, so, making Mototoshi look like a fool. So, um, Kensho is making this example that uh, Shunzai is just making himself look ridiculous. And, uh, okay, so I've talked about some poems where there's disagreement about um, what things and the types of critical argument there is, but what about beautiful poems? What about poems which were thought to be lovely? Well, um, Shunze uses this term yokiji, um, a tie of quality for poems where he thinks they're so superlative that they both must win. Um, so here's an example. Furusato ni ideshi ni masaru namida kama arashi no makura yume ni wakarete. My home I left in floods of tears. The wild wind round my pillow breaks us apart in dreams. Azumaji no yowa no nagame o kataranam, miyako no yama ni kakaru tsukikage. Upon the eastern roads at night I turn my gaze. Tell him that, O oh, moonlight sinking towards the mountains around the capital. And Shunze, all this um, particular round, says the left and right say, no faults um, in judgment. The left starts with my home I left in floods and concludes with the wild and round my pillow breaks us apart in dreams. This is a form of words, the quality of which I am entirely able to con unable to convey with my own clumsy expressions. But the rites, O moonlight sinking towards the mountains around the capital, um, is awash with the sense of tears, and so it is most unclear which should win or lose. Both truly seem to reflect the topic of love and travel well. The poems have been so good that every round that my brush is drenched with this old man's tears, and I can find no other way to express it. Okay, so... Just a few remarks, I know I'm getting close to my time, um, about how we are actually translated in some of the decisions that I've made and what, what that means. So one of the first questions one needs to ask is what is a waka in translation? What does a poem, a Japanese poem actually look like in translation? So here is uh, a poem from Kokinshu, probably the single most famous waka of all. Tsuki aranu haru ya mukashi no haru naranu wagami hitotsu wa motonomi ni shite. Here is a translation by Laurel Rod. Is this not that moon? Is this spring not that spring we shared so long ago? It seems that I alone am unaltered from what was then, and one by myself. Um, is this not that moon? And spring is as the spring of old, is it not? Only this body of mine is as it ever was. Um, and if you want to go to that link, you'll find 41 different translations of this same waka, dating from the 1860s all the way through to about 2010. So it's been one of the very, very heavily translated poems. Okay, but both Laurel and I have, of course, translated um, these single line of the Japanese waka into five separate lines of English text. Okay, so we took that decision that what to, make, to do that. Okay, but this would be an equally appropriate translation of Narihira's poem there. Okay, is this not that moon? 
Yes, it is the same, for the moon does never change, and spring is as the spring of old, is it not? But tis another year, so tis another different spring, and only this body of mine is as it ever was, but I know full well I am a year older and unchanged. The past, when gone, tis gone for good, alas. So, as a translation, that's explaining all of the various, many of the more senses going deeper into the poem and putting it into a single English form. Okay. Um, it's because of the way in which this particular poet, Adiwara no Narihira, loads so many ideas into his poetry that Kino Tsudayuki, one of the most famous crit Japanese classical critics, um, in 1915 says, his conception is excessive and his diction is insufficient. So too, many, too few words and too many ideas crammed into his poems. Okay. Now, not many po um, translators would actually translate Waka in this lengthy way, explaining everything. Um, and so I took that decision, I need to stick with the five lines, because that's largely the expectations of what people expect to see um, when they're look, reading a collection of poetry. Another decision. Here are four, four poems um, which were all translated by Laurel Rod from the Shinkok Inshu. Um, now, Laurel took a decision as a translator that her translation should respect the, should um, reflect the 57577 five, seven syllable pattern of the Japanese originals. So, just as an example, scattered as the dried field, stalks of field grass on short ridge meadow, their lit tips burnt with frost, my thoughts too are unsettled this season. Okay. So what I want to point out here is we have plants mentioned here, stalks of field grasses. Um, all right, come on grass, low rushes, okay. um, low growing reeds, she says here. Okay. If we look at the original of poems, we'll see the original poems all refer to the identical plant, okay, the, which is common grass, in fact. Okay. So because Laurel has taken the decision to reflect the 57577 pattern, she can't actually refer to the actual poem which the original poems are referring to in order to match her syllable count. So she's prioritised um, syllable count and therefore understanding of the, of the individual poems as individual pieces of work rather than linking them in with the broader um, canon of work and demonstrating that these are poems written using similar vocabulary and um, referring to an identical piece of um, botanical apparatus in order to create a particular effect. Okay, so here is uh, some example of mines. So when I, when I took a decision, I took it was much more important to show that um, linkage of the poets working with identical vocabulary. So I took a decision to always, um, as far as possible, translate the same words the same throughout the entire competition, and to add explanations. This is the explanation about Kogon grass on the page there, um, to give people an idea about what it actually meant. So you'll find extensive commentary in there, and you can take a look later. Um, I did, of course, go talk about ex, um, intertextuality, but I'll skip over that as I'm almost out of time. So go going on there, to, sorry? A bit longer, okay, well, in which case we'll go back here. Okay, so. Um, Intertextuality is a key uh, part of this po poetry, as I said. Um, so we have this, what, this poem um, here, Misiyaki no nani no nikosan, kusa no hara hitotsu ni kawaru nobe no keshiki ni. Okay. Of the sights of autumn, what should I recall? The fields of grasses have become but one, single plain within my view, by Yoshitsune. Now, the right state, fields of grasses sounds poor. It's rubbish, sounds awful. So, why do they say, say that? Um, because Kusanohara is redolent and um, brings, calls to mind a cremation ground. And they think it's poor taste to be referring to a place where bodies are burnt um, in the highly aesthetic venue of a poetry competition. Shunze, however, completely disagrees. He says, um, the left's, what should I recall, the fields of grasses is certainly evocative. Okay. Um, the gentleman's right, feel, gentleman of the right's reason for finding fault with fields of grasses is highly flawed. Murasaki Shikibu was better at writing prose than composing poems. Thus, the festival of the cherry blossoms is particularly evocative. It is highly regrettable for one to compose poetry without having read the tale of Genji. The left's poem is better, and I make it the winner. So, he's saying, in fact, if you read this poem correctly, Okay, read this particular phrase correctly, then you'll see it's not referring to a cremation ground, or other it might be, but that is overwritten by the intertextual references which um, are being made in the poem. And these are to the chapter Hanoen from the uh, Tale of Genji, Genji Monogatari, Japan's crown jewel of classical literature. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, Hanum al En is um, the chapter in which Genji, um, the shining prince, the perfect man and lover, is wandering around the palace rather drunk after a festival um, and attempting to get in to see his mother-in-law, but the door is locked, so he can't get in to see his mother-in-law. Um, so he goes to the palace in which his uh, sister-in-law, um, the Lady Kokiden, is, and finds the door open. So he sneaks inside and encounters Kokiden's younger sister, the Lady Oborozukiya, who has come forward to view the moon. Um, and they make love. Um, and she's actually quite fond, uh, happy with this, um, maybe not initially, but she's happy enough with him to see him a number of times afterwards. And in the end, um, he is caught in her bed by her father, and this is the reason for his exile from um, Kyoto for a while. As part of their toing and froing and discussion, discussions, however, Oboro Zukiyo um, quotes, quotes this poem, or quotes this poem, Ukimi yo ni yagata kiena ba tazunete mo kusa no hara o ba toaji toya yomo. If struck with sadness from the world, I should at last be gone. Inquiries um, among the fields of grasses you would not seek, I think. Okay. So, um, Shunze is saying, because this uh, phrase, kusa no hara, fields of grasses, is used in this very, very evocative and erotic um, passage from the tale of Genji, um, it must be evoke these same meanings in the poem. You need to understand Genji in order to read this. Um, and this statement that it's highly regrettable for one to compose poetry without, without having read the tale of Genji is probably the single most quoted line from the entire Rokjukban Utawase um, and was responsible perhaps single-handedly for getting people to read Genji and quote poems from it. Um, so it's one of the significance of the competition. So why translate it? Why do it? Well, it's a beautiful collection of poetry. Now, when I first put this down, I said a collection of beautiful poetry, but actually that's probably not the case. Um, some of the poems aren't as good as others. Um, it's in its entirety, um, reading through the poems one after another and seeing how different poets approach different pieces that you experience the joy and the pleasure of Waka, I think. We see competing views of criticism and poetics. And I've given you a flavour of that in the um, statements by Shunze and Kensho about their poems, which we see there. We see a view of medieval Japanese aesthetics coming through as we have Shunze's statements about what makes a beautiful poem and indeed the use of Genji in there. And we see demonstrations of poetic techniques and illustrations of conservative and novel approaches to poetic composition, okay? all of which I think are still relevant and useful to us today. Um, Finally then, just to finish up, I started this talk by saying that Shunze was worried that his um, um, work would not be useful for posterity. And he was far from the only person to have this worry about the composition, because Kensho has a statement about it too in his Chinjo. What does he say about it? He says, the present poetry competition, the recitation of the rounds, the critical discussions, the sincerity of the arrangements will pass into the traces of the past. If my ideas should not be mistaken, they may be of some unknown use to folk in years to come, and I humbly wonder if perhaps you may feel that there is some purpose to my pitiful thoughts and what I have stored up in my aged baskets. However, being Kenshaw, he just can't resist having a final dig at the judge. And it would be great if it finished then, but he just can't resist it. And what does he have to say? He says, thus, the reason why I have chosen some of my poems and inserted my views into place in the records of the competition is that just as the glory of spring arises from rotten trees, when one's poems are judged according to idiotic criteria, <laughs> one is motivated to review the materials used and the reasoning. And why not? Thank you very much. <laughs>